Welcome back for another helping of oysters, clams, and cockles presented by Bolin Media. Please respect and enjoy the podcast. I am Brother Ross here with Brother Barrett, and we will be here as we always have been. <laughs> Brother Barrett, did I oh, tell sure you not. things sure. heated up later in season two, or you, did I tell you things heated up later you, in season you, two? You did, you did. And, um,. I, I, even if I had just like fully believed you, I mean, I did fully believe you, but uh, but there was no way for you to to oversell it. I would say because um, six, seven, and then eight, nine. I mean, you know, we love a penultimate episode around these parts. Oh yeah, and baby. and and the penultimate didn't disappoint, nor did uh, the episode prior to it. Uh, and we we are just we're on a. You know this this ship it's 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 taken off straight for the sun and it hasn't slowed down yet, and uh, and Ross, um, I, I we can't answer the question to who built the foundation when there is no foundation. Wow, yeah, that do, it becomes problematic for uh, one that, of our catchphrases. That, that seems like a that seems like a a bit of an issue uh-huh. uh, in it. Um, so yeah, I mean, in it, bro. Good lord, lot lots to. Lots to digest, lots to talk about, and um, I, you know, now I will say that some of what happened was, uh, you know, either I'm just like very gifted in 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 prognostication, or uh, <laughs> it was all too obvious. Uh, not I, and I don't think it was the latter really. I think it's more the former. So let me just gas myself up because um, it didn't. It, it, when the things happened that I had predicted were going to happen, it wasn't like an eye roll. It wasn't you talking like, about like Demerzel specifically? Demerzel, because pred- that was I pred- that was laid out pretty. I pre- yeah, I predicted that Hober Marshmallow would save the day. Yeah, at, you know, like there were just some, you know, just just some things like that. Yeah, that that we had kind of talked about that that really came to fruition. So yeah, you were um, you were spot on with some of your uh, more robotic predictions. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> That I couldn't really obviously yeah, comment on yeah, at the time. Yeah, Hope, yeah. Hopefully, I had a good poker face. And not but. to mention, I mean, not, look, you you've all watched the episode, so there's no no real spoilers here. But what what we got? Zombie, zombie, Selden. Yeah, I don't know, man. Um, WTF? I don't. I'm. We'll have to get to that when we get to it. <laughs> we'll have to get to that when we get to it. We've got but one I, episode I, left still. The finale. That's true. We do have the finale. I'm glad that we saved it for a solo show so that we could. We can talk about the season as a whole once we've once we've wrapped it all up, um, but yeah, we 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 better jump in because there's there's a lot. Let's do it. But before we dive into episodes eight and nine of season two of Foundation on Apple TV Plus, I expect many of you here today would like to hear Barrett and I react to and do a breakdown of the first House of the Dragon season two teaser trailer that was released over the weekend. If you haven't watched it, you can check Tease it me. out on our Instagram or Twitter account. But because we have so much foundation to discuss today and we also need to discuss the new True Detective Night Country trailer that HBO also dropped, we're going to talk about both on our Patreon exclusive episode later this week. Every week on Patreon.com slash Oysters, Clams, Cockles, we drop an ad-free episode exclusively for those subscribing for as little as $5 a month in support of the podcast. Our show would not exist without the support of the Clam Fam and Mollusk Militia on Patreon. And when you subscribe today and ensure our podcast will live long into the future, you'll immediately gain access to our entire backlog of ad-free exclusive episodes, including our entire companion podcast for all 86 episodes of The Sopranos, also House of the Dragon Season 1 bonus coverage, as well as Succession, The White Lotus, The Last of Us, and Silo bonus coverage. I also went into our Patreon and created a collection for our movie club, as it is known, where Barrett and I did a companion podcast for 16 different movies so far, including Oppenheimer, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Parasite, Joker, 1917, Knives Out, Casino Royale, The Talented Mr. Ripley, and more. So go to patreon.com slash oysters, clams, cockles today and join over 1,000 other listeners in support of our show to hear us discuss the new House of the Dragon teaser trailer later this week, as well as obviously more of Foundation Season 2, Episodes 8 and 9. There's a... Uh... There's a lot you're excited for, but but the people probably don't know that top of your list is the Joker sequel starring uh, Lady Gaga. That's, oh yeah, yeah, yeah oh, just, sure. Off mic, you just can't stop talking. That's about true. It, so, I bring yeah. it up constantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so let's jump into episode eight, <laughs> season two, episode eight, Foundation, titled "The Last Empress," where Brother Day. I'm going to kind of do this out of order. All right, because, yeah, yeah, because I think it makes sense. Brother yeah. Day announces. A publicly broadcast execution of Polly Verisoff and Brother Constant. 
And during the broadcast, Day attempts to tie foundation to the terrorists who killed 100 million people in the destruction of the Star Bridge. And uh, the execution itself is taking place on the anniversary of that bombing. So he's really saying, like, these foundation people, we gave them the gift of exile instead of killing them, right? Mm-hmm. Instead of ki- killing Harry Seldon and his followers, we, we put them out there. We were trying to be nice. And what did they do? They went and teamed up with the terrorists who killed 100 million of us. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I, I would I'd just like to 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 throw in here that one of the questions that's still out there floating in the wind is that I don't think we actually know who was responsible for the that for that terrorist attack for the implosion of the Star Bridge. Yeah, they just blamed um, they blame the Thespans and the uh, Anacreans and the Anacreans, but really it 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 seems. It seems like all of the the harder evidence points to the fact that it wasn't either of them. That it was that 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 was that they were kind of um, framed for that the scapegoats. And so that's you know that I it I, I think that's it's possible that that's unimportant. That the that the important part is that they they had their scapegoats and and they laid it on them and and that's kind of a forever thing now as we see here hundreds and hundreds of years later. Um, but uh, or or I guess 150, 170, 180 years later. But uh. Still, still of note because every time they mention that, I'm like, yeah, but they didn't really do that shit. Man. Yeah, yeah, he's using it though. So to the full effect, Brother sure. Day is using it to uh, cast more blame here. So right before Brother Constant is beheaded by this little guillotine necklace device mm. that Brother Day has resurrected for the occasion, Hero Hober Marshmallow drives a whisper ship into the middle of the whole thing. Essentially, uh, as they put it back on. Uh, uh, What's the name of the planet where Foundation is? Terminus. As they put it back on Terminus, declaring war on behalf of the Foundation. And Bell Rios is watching the broadcast when Hober Mallow shows up on camera and he says, I knew it was him. Before I even saw his fucking face, I knew it was him. <laughs> that was just like a, a great yeah. moment there. Uh, so Hober gets out and starts trying to fight his way to Brother Constant and Polly. It's like chaos. When he, when he oh, yeah. drove this thing in there, he knocked everybody everywhere. Mm-hmm. He turned all the guards into like idiotic uh, James Bond henchmen or like stormtroopers. They're, they're just like, where is he? I, I can't see him. I'm like, well, we can see him pretty plainly. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, we don't have on those those helmets, you know? Yeah, it they makes have it the, tough. Re- the real dark shields. It's like, you can't see shit in those. Yeah, they, those guys those guys were utterly utterly useless yeah, up there. Yeah. Um, so he's trying to fight his way to Constant and Polly, and then Becky, the dog monster, also participates and almost kills Brother Day. Huge moment there, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. another great one from Lee Pace, just uh, showing you like the different sides of Brother Day, and the, he he lets out like this shriek, like ah, yeah, when yeah, yeah. when that and when Becky bites into him and chunks him almost off of the uh, massive platform that they're yeah. on. Unfortunately, Becky ends up being shot and falling off the roof of the palace. Yeah, and that was you know I ne- I never like to see a pet go. Huge bummer. Um, but also, you know, much like I take issue with, um, sorry guys, it's going to take me a minute to get the names, the, the 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 hot D names back in my head. Oh, yeah. But much as I took issue with What's-Her-Face not, you know, and her dragon not just lighting everybody on fire in the, uh, in, on, in the, the presentation there. You know the scene I'm talking about. Yeah, everybody, I do. Everybody knows. I do. The queen uh, who never was or whatever. Yes, yes. The queen who never was, right? Right. In, in Red Maven or whatever her dragon's name is. Uh, Rhaenys. Rhaenys. Okay. I was going to say Rhaenys, but I didn't think that that was right. And I didn't, I, I'd, I'd, I would have, you know, didn't want to be wrong. Sure. There. Yeah. Well. Uh, anyway, Becky, you can't just like reach out one of those stems oh, and just like yeah. grab him on the way uh, as you fall down too. Pull right. Him with you. You know, because she kind of like staggers. She she she's like, Wah! do the old Gandalf thing where he where he you know that 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 monster uh, demon that he has to fight whips whips uh-huh. him on the leg and yeah. pulls him down with him. Yeah. But no, no, uh, it it wasn't to be. Becky is stunned. She can't uh, she can't kill two birds with with one stone. And um, R.I.P. Becky. R.I.P. Becky. Yeah, she gone. She gone. Uh, Hober Mallow is able to get constant onto his ship. And they escape, at least for the time being. But they're unable to save Polly, who is left behind. And they really built this scene well. Like, when they've got uh, Polly and Constant out there. You, I mean, like, my first watch, I was like, oh, they, they're, this is it. They're done. Mm-hmm, I mean, we mm-hmm, all assumed, mm-hmm. based on the last couple weeks, that they were in a really, really bad spot here. Yep. 
And it looked like this is something that Brother Day was going to be able to go through with. Um, and they had us watching the broadcast, too, so that, you know, we could see the people on Terminus's reaction. Her two dads, Brother Constant's dads, were both, like, super bummed. Everybody's, like, saying that prayer together. We feel really confident in the two dads thing. We're, like, positive that yeah, it's, 100%. Two, it's two dads. Yeah, yeah. those right. are her dads. Okay. Or they were. Um, RIP to everybody yeah. in this episode. But... Yeah, so Polly gets left behind, and then Hober Mallow and Brother Constant uh, arrive at Terminus, and uh, they're captured by Bel Rios, but first they get naked. They get freaky. And naughty yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah, which which was also mailed in. Like, <laughs> if you didn't know those two were going to have some kind of a romantic relationship at this point, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. They, they made sure you know now. Right. Um, I like the way that scene unfolded. It was like one of those things where they had completely different approaches to it. Mm-hmm. The two the two people in, engaging in the sexual intercourse, Barry. Right, right. And it made for some humor. Coitus. Mm-hmm. Coitus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it made for some some humorous dialogue. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, pretty heartfelt. You know? You you like these two characters together. Of course, of course, of course you do. And uh, but yeah, they end up getting captured by Bel Rios anyway. So um somewhere in the mix here, Glaywin, who is Bel Rios' husband, mm-hmm. that remember he thought was dead for six years. He tells Rios that Hober Mallow proved that Empire can be touched. So he's just continuing Glaywin to push this idea of rebellion, right, onto Bel Rios, who is, of course, the Emperor's top and, like, best, most powerful general. Mm-hmm. Um, By request of Demerzel. Which is just something important to keep in your mind for later in our discussion today. But yes, yeah, of course, because Demerzel is pulling all the strings here. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brother Day, obviously pretty pissed off about this attack by Hober Mallow and the execution gone wrong. So he decides he's going to go to Terminus himself to take on Foundation, to reclaim the technology that has allowed them to be a thorn in his side. And he's going to take Polly Varus off with him. And then, like, on the way there, Polly and Brother Day have this very poignant conversation about how they're both just following the wishes of dead men like Polly is following Harry Seldon Day is following Cleon the first and this is something that comes up uh repeatedly over these two episodes kind of just giving us a weird parallel to the way all religions function right mm-hmm. you're, you're you're following the wishes of someone who has long passed um most of the time and uh, I, I just liked that scene a lot. That was really, really well done. Yeah. Uh, I, I also probably semi-important to note that Queen Sarath um, kind of seizes the opportunity for, for Day, kind of showing what potentially is a little bit of like uh, just savvy, political savvy, as he's as he, you know, makes this this kind of move to go to Terminus, which is out of the wheelhouse of the, the Cleons. Yeah, it's, not something you know, they it's do. not something that they do. They do not make diplomatic forays like this. They do not go try to talk. They 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 do let blood. You know what I mean? Yeah. They 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 typically use power and use violence. Uh Brother and, Dusk and Demerzel are both like, no, yeah. don't do this. And and so Queen Seraph Sarath? Sarath? Sarath. Sarath. Yeah. Kind of like uh I don't know if she's kinda like I think she's kind of trying to reward this this train of thought a little bit. Oh, definitely. And so she goes and 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 kind of makes out with Day and like gives him gives him some smooches, kind of as like a like yeah, this is like keep this up, this is good, this is the type of thing that we want going on. Well, she wants his ass to leave for sure. Yeah, right. Like it's a window for her of opportunity to to do the things that she That's does true. later That's in this also episode. True. Also, yeah, so it is yeah. savvy, definitely manipulative. Um, and he says, "I'll give you a planet as a wedding gift." Mm. And Demerzel is kind of behind her, like, put off by the whole situation. What? Yeah. 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 Um, on Terminus, one of Constance's dads, the director, Cermak, struggles with his faith, gets drunk, and calls out Selden for allowing his daughter to be a pawn in his game. And so Selden, and I'm pretty sure this is the first time we've seen him do this, just appears from out of the vault. No, like, not the first time. Well, we've seen him walk out of the vault. But I don't know if we've seen him like just suddenly be next to somebody or like behind somebody the way that he does with this guy, and that happens multiple times in this two episode I th- stretch. I think we have seen it before. It was pretty, yeah, pretty wild. Um, and he explains, Selden does for the thirtieth time to director Cermak that psychohistory does not account for individuals and their fates, but that he does see and care about individuals like Constant, that everyone matters, and again, 
just another very poignant and beautiful little scene here yeah. between these yeah. two guys that, that kind of gives more depth to, to, to one character in director Sermak that I don't know if we're even supposed to care that much about. He's gone by the end of episode nine. Mm-hmm. But also kind of giving us more differentiation between the Seldons that we have. There's just like, there's a pretty big difference between the one that's in the vault who pops out here to have this mm. talk and the one that's over on uh, Ignis. Yeah. So just something I'm taking note of. Over on Ignis, that's Ignis. Soldier <laughs> Boy uh, tell him further breaks bad and traps Salvor in a hole of a prison with these devices overhead that keep her mind in a prison as well. Yeah, right. And it turns out Tellum has been body jumping anytime she nears death, just finding another vessel to house her consciousness like many times over Yeah, in the span of her life. And she tells Gail that she, Tellum, has been working to bring Gail to Ignis for years. That it was Tellum's voice that Gail heard drawing her away from her home planet, that she planted the visions of waves destroying Gail's home planet when she was a kid. That basically she's been controlling Gail's like entire life mm. from afar after like feeling and recognizing her power or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Which as she was saying all that, and as I'm sitting here saying it now, I'm still questioning like how much of it was true. Uh-huh. Like, was was all of this stuff with Gail that we've seen play out? Really driven by this crazy woman over on Ignis. That's Ignis. Um, <laughs> well, I I think yeah, that's a really at least good, parts of it. That's are a true. really good question. But I think that what we we've got kind of two sets of facts here. One is that Gale has occasionally had visions like the one of the the giant wave crashing on on um, whatever uh, her planet was called. Uh, Shit, yeah, it's not coming to me. Um, not Sawena, but you've got it there. Synax. Synax, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so the one with the giant wave kind of taking out Synax right. is even brought up in an earlier episode. I can't remember if it's early season two or end of season one. I think Harry or 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 um, Warden James Harden Selden uh, mentions that, sh- that that when they're like talking about her her foresight and her prognostication abilities and, and and all that type of stuff and like her ability to see the future they bring that up as one that like well that never happened that never you you never saw that that what you didn't have that vision and then it happened right so there are some things where she kind of like sees something and then we don't actually know that it ever happens or you know what i mean because like when we do go back to Synax, i sure maybe that happened but also it's been 180 years so like it is all water at that point so you know we don't we don't really know um at the same time there are multiple things where she has like a sense of something and then and like she lifts up a shield right as a rock flies through the windshield of the spaceship and like would hit her in the face you know what yeah. i mean so like she definitely has has the ability to prognosticate and to see some some future stuff there are also visions that were that I think we're maybe a little bit less certain about, which I think Tellum here is is uh, taking responsibility for. Yeah, uh, I'm inclined to believe her. She seems pretty pretty powerful. Yeah, this old this old Tellum here. Uh huh. Uh huh. I have no reason not to believe yeah. her, but it was just I didn't want to believe her. Right. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm like you know. Yeah. So everything up to this point with Gail was driven yeah, by this batch of right, crazy and, lady. And, and now you have to look at everything that ha- that d- did happen with Gail in a kind of a new light. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But like you said, we have seen Gail have successful like premonitions of things or, or feelings and, and, you know, go and change the future as a result. Like mm-hmm. when she went and uh, discovered um, her old boyfriend who she had a kid with, who is now James Harden Selden, mm-hmm. um, stabbing Harry. Raish. Right. Raish. Yeah. Raish. Yep. Um, anyway, moving on. Fortunately, Salvor James Harden has the Prime Radiant hidden on her person, even when she's imprisoned in this hole, mm-hmm. and she uses it to contact the Vault and the other Harry Selden over on Terminus. And this was a really complicated scene, like, just from a logistics standpoint. Like, Harry, Terminus Harry has to realize he is a copy and that there is more than one of him, and that he has withheld knowledge from himself yeah. to some end, right? And then Terminus Harry figures out, like, there must be a, must be another foundation. I loved this scene, by the way. He's like, ah, oh, I'm the left hand. <laughs> Damn it. It was just, it, it was, 
simultaneously both like very easy and convenient and almost on the nose that he is able to work through this so quickly. Yeah. And yet also makes perfect sense. Yeah. Because as soon as he has one shred of information, he is Harry Seldon with most of the, with all of the same brain power and just a few pieces of data missing. So he connects the dots. So he connects the dots so quickly and that actually makes sense. So I just, it was actually, I thought they executed this really well and I thought the writing was good and then and and then obviously brought to life by Jared Harris who just kind of like crushes it as he's just kind of like, it, it just all happened, it just all clicks into place for him and his kind of, his, uh, indignation that that he's the left hand is pretty is pretty funny it was hilarious yeah, yeah yeah jared harris an unbelievable job and one of the things like the i keep having my attention drawn to over these two episodes again is like the different representations of harry selden like when he pops out to talk to brother constance drunk dad mm-hmm. who's all upset he's in like a sleek black well, yeah this the, yeah vault vault said selden has taken to wearing like an all black suit like he looks like a god Kind of right, like like uh, the way they present like Morgan Freeman in those Jim Carrey yeah, movies. Yeah, right, right. And then you'll see him in other scenes where he's like discombobulated and wild eyed, <laughs> and like he just like it's he's really good at putting on these different faces. So, um, anyway, yes, watching Terminus Harry have all the wheels turn is is really really fun. And Selden or Salvor ends up telling Harry everything about what's happening on Ignis, right? And she tells Harry about Hober Mallow, Ignis. which it turns out is what causes Terminus Harry to call for the foundation to bring him Hober Mallow. Yeah, so this this throws a bit of a curveball at us because it's it's affecting the timeline in a way that we did not totally realize was... We had no idea. It, skew, it skews us from what we previously th- thought was the was like this very linear storytelling. Like everything we're, that we're watching is yeah, happening it's kind at of once. happening at the same time or in succession, um, yeah. you know, kind of how it's shown. And now we know that it's not. And so that that's, that's again, going to take like some computing to like maybe put the pieces back together in a different, in a different arrangement. I'm not totally sure that, that it matters, but... It, it is interesting because basically now we know that what is happening on Ignis um, is is kind of like much earlier than where we are in the timeline with Empire. Yes. So yeah, um, and yeah, because we see Harry not, not right by, not by a long mar- not by a big margin, you know, but like maybe months, right? Something like Something that. Like that. So just kind of interesting that they've been kind of telling that story a little bit behind where we are currently, and that we dr- that it, and that we drop back for this big reveal to see that, that, and this also touches on, this also brings up something that I was talking about last week, which is this whole, this, this very frequent idea of time travel with the whole butterfly effect type stuff, right? which is if you, if you do something like Salvor does here, which is kind of give information to somebody that's not supposed to have information so that he can stack the deck or make or, or affect something and then like and so then you're asking the question, okay, well so is that it, it was that kind of part of the psychohistory that 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 we know that something like this is going to happen and this is all just as it was fated to be or are you actually changing things right which could then change everything else. Right. You know, and so it's it's kind of chicken or egg, it's a paradox, it's a it's it's kind of a classic time travel trope I would say. As but, you but here it is, right here. We've got one where Salvor goes in, and like they're not really supposed to do this. She's not supposed to tell him that he, that he's not supposed to know about the potential second foundation, right? Re, uh, first Harry, Harry one said that, right? That it's important that the first foundation doesn't know. And so it does does this whole does the Hober Mallow thing? And I'm going to jump jump ahead a little bit, but does this little tidbit from Salvor? create this this void that we're left with at the end of episode nine where there's no foundation and there's not a there's there, there's no at the moment it, it's looking pretty bleak for any for any foundation so yeah this was a big uh this is kind of a big deal big moment right here. yeah really big moment here and the question we were asking last week and it may have been on patreon was kind of like so do does something that these people do create this mule character that's right. going to end up being yeah. a huge problem in the future? Yep. And with the way things unfold in these two episodes, just to throw it out quickly, we don't have to discuss it right now, but like, it did occur to me, oh, I'm I'm betting the mule is one of these mentalics on this planet mm. that's like left behind after 
we deal with Soldier Boy Tellum. Could be. So, yeah, this is a big, big moment in terms of like uh, the time travel stuff and the sci fi stuff, and just a really cool reveal yeah. that everything we've been seeing on Ignis is happening earlier in the story's timeline than what we've been seeing happen on Trantor. Right. Big twist. Uh, Brother Dusk ends up finding Rue sneaking into Demerzel's chambers, okay? And this is like the, the meatiest part of the episode for me. Rue tells Brother Dusk that Cloud Dominion has developed the ability to restore memories. So she actually has all of her memories from her time here on Trantor. She has been misleading him, and he's like, I thought we trusted each other. And she's like, no, you thought I trusted you. Mm. And uh, she asks Brother Dusk about how Demerzel came to serve Empire. And all Brother Dusk can say is she will always be here as she always has been. And it's a weird moment at first when you're watching this scene unfold because you're like, well, that was a weird line. And then he says it again. And you're like, okay, what the fuck is going on here? And then he says it again. You're like, oh, my God. And then she even points out, Rue does, like, you're just as programmed as the robot Dimmerzel herself, right? Yeah, like, itself, yeah. excuse me. Um, but Dusk has zero memory of Dimmerzel's origin, which feels really problematic immediately. You're just like, okay, what the hell? And we've obviously delved into and dealt with the fact that these guys don't have all the memories they should have, that somebody's clearly been tampering with their shit, mm -hmm. and things start to come together pretty quickly here in Episode Eight. So uh, we've also got Brother Dawn and Sarith, who do indeed go through with the plan to get pregnant with his child rather than, rather than allowing Brother Day the honor. So, like, he flies off to deal with Terminus. Mm -hmm. And she goes ahead and pulls the trigger on this plan to carry Brother Dawn's child, right? And he does like the little... Removes his nanobots. Nanobot deal, which doesn't take long, but does look a little painful. Yeah. Um, and Queen Sarath points out to Brother Dawn that Empire, they're merely pawns, right? And, and Dimmerzel is, in fact, the one running the show. And he seems like pretty immediately to have that click in his head as like, oh, shit, that's... Mm. That is true. <laughs> that is what is happening here. Yeah. Wow. Um, so Brother Dusk, the old one, finds a secret passageway behind one of the palace paintings. And this was a little... That whole way he discovered that, I was just like, I don't... What the fuck just happened? He's well, like, wait a minute. This, this paint is supposed to be moving. <laughs> <laughs> he discovers it because he's telling us the story of the robot wars. Right. Right? Yeah. And so he, going through the history with Rue. Yeah. And so he goes over to the to the that that part that of piece it. of the mural, which kind of like depicts the robot wars in some way, shape, or form. With yeah. Like eight planets lining up or some shit like that. Which is what like he saw might, like yeah. on Dimmerzel's desk when Rue was going yeah, through her quarters. Yeah, right. It was all connected somehow, but and not in a way my and, pea brain and, could and, understand. And, and again, using information from episode nine, but is that is that supposed to be like our solar system, maybe? It's a, it's because the, that that solar system. I don't know about our solar system. Well, because the robots came from Earth, just like the humans did. Okay, yeah. Which is you know you know what I mean. Like yeah, that's yeah. It, Which I also thought is just a very cool wrinkle is that the big scary robots who oh, there's only one left of are like the, they all came from Earth, but it's almost like they're it's almost like the robots are the Earth humans in now, a way. Yeah. I don't know. Well, it they're the only kinda, ones that carry the knowledge of Earth. Exact. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that I thought that was kind of interesting. Um. But yeah, so then then they see this this little little piece of paint that's not moving, and uh, next thing you know, we're in the secret passage. Somehow, right? fucking unlocks a yeah. massive secret portal, uh, which we do deal with more in episode nine. But like, just to make sure we are clear on what Barrett just said, Brother Dusk explains to Rue and all of us watching the history of robots, their relationship to humans, how it all went wrong, that robots once served humanity, humans were cruel to them. Robots came to understand their station. They wanted personhood, recognized, and then when it was not, they resorted to violence. So a robot broke the first law and murdered Emperor Benefoss, which started a war between not only robot and human, but also but robot, robot and, robot. and robot. robot. So humans eventually won. All robots were destroyed, robots except for robots. one. Yeah, <laughs> robots killing <laughs> robots. Except for one, Dimmerzel. Um, which cues us up for Dimmerzel's origin story, which we, of course, get in episode nine. And the episode closes with a close-up of Dimmerzel's face, which is, like, revealing her to be the last empress, the episode's title reference, and also parallels the close-up of Brother Day's face that we get to end episode nine, mm. where it's him, like, in awe, smiling, 
taking in the destruction of mm-hmm. uh, Terminus. Yeah. So yeah, strong episode eight. Yeah, and very essen- strong. And and essentially, like the the that big reveal at the end there, you know, is this, it, it tells us right there that Demerzel is essentially she is actually Empire. She's in charge. That these that 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 the that the point of the clones is to carry on the the Cleon of it all, but she is the guiding constant essentially. Right. She is essentially always the one really in charge. Like, which we started, you know, you start to pick up the pieces yeah. over the uh, yes. episode five, six, seven, that something is really off with her. Yeah. And the more scenes they give you with her seemingly guiding Brother Day to the mm-hmm. decisions that he makes, like, it's it's not too big of a jump to know that we would get here. Of course, the why that we get in episode nine, the how, mm-hmm. how did this come to be, is extremely crazy. Yeah. And uh, so we'll get into that now. This bustling holiday season, you might be looking for nutritious, convenient meals to keep you energized on jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service, can help you fuel up fast for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. With chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door, you'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle while tackling all your holiday to-dos. Today's episode is brought to you by Factor. With two kids under five at home, and a business to run, and a total lack of cooking skills I have been relying on and loving Factor all year long. But now, during the insanity of the holiday season, I am more thankful for Factor than ever. Cross meal prepping off your list this holiday season with Factor. Skip the meal planning, grocery shopping, chopping, prepping, and cleaning up, and get Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals delivered to your door. They're ready in just two minutes, so all you have to do is heat and enjoy. If you're looking for calorie-conscious options over the holidays that don't skimp on flavor... Try delicious dietitian approved calorie smart meals with around or less than 550 calories per serving or need an extra boost to support your wellness goals and feel your best during the holidays. Try protein plus meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. With Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice. They offset 100% of their delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for their production sites and offices, and feature sustainably sourced seafood in their meals. This December, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door ready in just two minutes. No prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash OCC50. And use code OCC50 to get 50% off. That's code OCC50 at factormeals.com slash OCC50 to get 50% off. So the penultimate episode of season two starts with a long flashback to 610 years ago when Cleon the first comes across the secret chamber that we saw at the end of episode eight. And it turns out That chamber was hidden for thousands of years, and inside it is Dimmerzel, who has been separated into pieces and imprisoned. And this was another, like, very Westworld setup here, like the robot being segmented. Yeah, yes. Um, And I I actually, when we were talking about the robot story, the history of the robot wars and all that, that all reminded me very much of the, kind of the, one of the, the main themes of Westworld was, which... Was kind of revolved around like at one at what point does sentience make you a person? Does it make you human? Yes, right. You know, yeah. and, and how and, much shit will a robot put up with before it before, turns on you? Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Uh, and and so those are, I think, kind of constants in the in the sci fi realm that we love to kind of try to wrap our arms around. But uh, but yeah, this also did you ever ever did you ever see the movie from like nineteen ninety eight with Jennifer Lopez called The Cell? I remember it, but I don't think I saw it. Okay. I remember being very freaked out by it, but I was also like 12 or 13 when I saw it and probably shouldn't have been seeing it. (laughs) Um, (laughs) You just couldn't resist that ass, though. (laughs) But even as a boy. Um, But there was, uh, there's a scene in in there where like a cow has been like dissected like this into little like cross sections and then separated in glass like that. Gnarly. And it and it reminded it, and that also is was something that I was reminded of here with this uh, with the visual here of Demerzel being um, being imprisoned like that basically. I think the first movie that freaked me out robot wise was I Robot, the Will Smith one, mm-hmm. um, which I would note the Will Smith I Robot robots look a lot like the ones that Tesla is like <laughs> creating as we speak. So. Another thing to keep an eye on. Tight, tight. Anyway, it turns out Dimmerzel is, and this was really like a big, like mind-blowing thing to try to take on the math of this 
Demerzel's story. She's yeah. 18,000 years old. Yeah. Yeah. At the point we meet here, her in this flashback. And she got <laughs> trapped in this situation by an emperor after her robot army lost a battle. So that emperor like studied and tortured Demerzel in this little cell uh, before eventually dying and leaving her trapped there for another 5,000 years until Cleon the first arrived as a small boy. Yeah, and I would, uh, let's also just, before we move on from the way that she's trapped here, you know, I, I talked last week about the, what type of hold or ability the Cleons have over her. And and potentially the ability to kill her. And yeah. Potentially the ability to kill her. And I think we're, th- this just made me think about how difficult it must be to actually kill these robots, even though they did, even though the humans did seem to do have won the to war, won yeah. the war. But like the only way to keep this thing from being itself and reconnecting all of its parts is to literally keep all of its parts separate from one another in like a frozen still frame. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, like, she she mentions what I thought was that's pretty wild. A really important line. She said that the emperor was at least in part studying her because she may be the key to making more of her kind. Mm-hmm. So it's like the guy who won the robot wars was basically like, okay, but we may need these later on. Yeah. How can we keep one alive but also totally harmless? Yeah. And the only way to do that was to <laughs> chunk her into f- fifteen different pieces in yeah. this strange hidden cell right. behind a fucking moving painting yeah a lot to process there yeah um so over time cleon the first you know he starts off as a little boy and he keeps going down there and visiting dimmerzel and i guess he has no fucking friends or family to spend time with it's just him and this freaky chopped up robot and for decades she tells him stories about the robot wars the human home planet of earth which as we've mentioned is like a myth at this point right um, all kinds of crazy shit, and they like become friends. And eventually, when he rolls in as looking like what we now know as Brother Day, she's she sees a window to manipulate Cleon the First, and she starts getting really erotic with her storytelling. Starts telling him all the sexy stories. Yeah, yeah she's basically yeah. feeding him like verbal porn <laughs> and, and, until he's so horny for robots that he can't take it anymore, um, which was was hilarious and also kind of sad, just yeah, like for him. Yeah. But uh, eventually, we see Cleon return to the cell looking like the Brother Dusk version of himself. And he has spent years, it turns out, searching the galaxy for a way to free Demerzel from her robot prison. And he ends up doing so. He frees her. But only for a moment is she truly free, which they they really make sure you understand. Like, mm-hmm. And here, in this one scene, she could have snapped his neck and, and run off. Yeah. But she didn't do it for one reason or another, and then uh, she fails to capitalize on it, and he slaps some new hardware into her neck that prevents her from ever harming him. Which is just interesting because we've literally seen, seen her, her snap murder. one of their necks. Yes. Yep. Brother yep. Dawn. Yep. In season one. Yep. So I'm not sure exactly Don't, how that, that works. Right. We do have to reconcile that. And uh, maybe we'll get a little bit more information about what she can and cannot do in the finale. The, the, on, the only thing that I can think of is that it, maybe at any one point with the programming, the one that she cannot hurt is day. Maybe. Maybe. And maybe, yeah. she can, maybe she can hurt the other two if it serves the empire or something like that. But I'm st- you're still kind of having to like write that out yourself and kind of jump through a hoop to get there. Yeah. So it it yes, it's strange. I'm sure everybody thought about that. Well, like we've literally seen her kill a Cleon. So Yeah. Uh yeah, not sure what that's about, but but yeah, I'm I'm kind of waiting for for the explanation there. But, yeah. at uh, least at this yeah. initial point we are told she can harm other people, but not empire, right? Yep. Not Cleon the 1st. And she, like, essentially is his slave now. And he does seem to love her in some sick way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so Cleon the First tells Demerzel all about his plans to create the genetic dynasty that we now know and love, telling her that she will, by all rights, serve as Empire herself, mm-hmm. basically, that she's going to be, like, the protector and mother secretly running the Empire through all these clones uh, as his, like, one real heir. Right, like she's Cleon the first heir, essentially, and also permanent prisoner. Yeah. Um. So all along, 
according to this flashback, obviously, everything that we have seen unfold on this show has been Dimmerzel actually running things Pulling through strings, these clone dudes. Manipulating them, pushing them, guiding them. Yes, yes. So the strong hand behind their back. Yeah. You know. And like we're seeing all this unfold in this flashback visually. And isn't it the hologram of Cleon the First that's explaining the story to Brother Dusk and Rue in present day? Yeah. Right? Yep. And when he's done telling the story, he's like, and now you can't leave. And just like, now you're trapped. Now they're now imprisoned trapped, yeah. where she yeah. was once imprisoned. Yeah. Right? And I, I think, you know, we, we kind of commented earlier on the, on in the season how kind of out of nowhere it was that, like, oh, Cleon the First, his memory is still intact and still exists. You can go in interact with this guy. You can cat. go interact yeah. with him. And it was kind of like down here in the dungeon, it, it, kind of a pulling the curtain back and oh here's here's oz right like right. kind of type of thing definitely like it just but i think it spoke to and maybe uh lent the possibility of that like his memory is more fully intact than we actually even know and that 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 even it's he still has a relationship with demerzel i think yeah the og cleon yeah i think the og this, through through this intact memory, basically. I think the OG Cleon, like they touch on at one point, they're like, you're not allowed to have like artificially intelligent, you know, like legacy mm, or whatever. That's right. Anymore. That's right. Well, it seems like that's exactly what he has. Okay. Because like, well, this well, is him down there, not in some pre programmed response thing. Like right. he's full on telling a story to these two slap dicks and then locking them in there. But but that is a good note because then I, I was saying that out loud and I was like, okay, well, why, why then why isn't he more prominent? If he wanted to be the, the showrunner forever, essentially, like why didn't he just like, wouldn't there be a way to have his memory kind of exist in perpetuity as well? Right. And maybe that's, maybe you just answered it is because it's not, you're not actually allowed to like have this artificial intelligence legacy. I mean, I think... That's part of it. I also think he is running things yeah, in perpetuity. Yeah. He's running them through Dimmerzel. Yeah. But, and maybe this answers our other question. Like, right. can he kind of, can he program her still? Like, Dimmerzel can't kill him. Yeah. She can kill any of these clone fuckers. <laughs> maybe But so. she can't maybe kill so. him. Yeah. I also love what the show is doing. Like, the depth of this entire conversation that Foundation is bringing to light here gets so much crazier over this three episode stretch <laughs> here at the end, where, like, now you've got. You've got multiple hologram deities like running the show in different places yeah, between yeah. like Harry and Cleon the First down here. You've got Dimmerzel as a fucking robot. <laughs> there are multiple Harrys, it turns out. By the way, one of the Harrys has a body that he was given by the ghost of a mathematician on some fucking random planet. Like it is absolute chaos. Yeah. yeah. And it is ghosts pulling the strings everywhere, right? Like people who aren't even alive anymore are running the show. Well, and that I mean that you got to think that that's an intentional message of the show. Definitely, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, that's what we, that's that, what we've that, got that going we on down there. Abide by we abide by societal rules and regulations set forth for us by the ghosts of dead men who who no longer longer exist. And you can relate that to religion, or you can relate that to the founding fathers of the U.S. Constitution. Right? Yep. There's like a million different ways you can go with that that we just kind of like blindly follow what was given to us by people that haven't been here for hundreds of years. Yeah. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. So Brother Day, for just, just to reflect, the scenes there at the beginning of this episode, the flashback, watching present day Dusk and Rue get locked in that room, this was powerful shit. Like, I was like, holy fuck. <laughs> Unreal. Now to leave that situation. Brother Day arrives on Terminus, and he finds that the Church of Scientism is actually an armory <laughs> creating personal auras, which the foundation has just like been handing out like hotcakes to their to their allies. Is like you get an aura, you get an aura, like Oprah. Um, yeah. Okay. T talk to me about this this whole scene. Yeah. Uh, I, Day feels some type of pull to the church, or right. or notices it, or it's given him a. He, Thinks it's sus. Basically. They got a heat reading on it. Okay. So they right. they were like, oh, clearly some shit is going on in okay. there. And so he goes down there with, um, let's say, not the absolute worst intentions. Um, right. <laughs> not good ones either. But but he goes down there and essentially is like, I I'm gonna let y'all surrender and accept whatever terms we give you, and I won't explode your planet. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. And then he goes into this church 
which is a bunch of science people making stuff and it kind of looks bombish. There's like, like I for sure, I I thought Pauli Verisov when he picks up that thing and like puts the iron in it. And he's like, and the, 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 not the warden, but the president or whatever. He's like, I've got iron. The director. The director. Yeah, yeah. those are really suspicious. Like, I they thought all they start were engaging I, in the yes. act. And everybody's kind of like giving like these little furtive glances to each other. And I was like, are they about to explode a bomb? Are they going to just gonna blow, do, this, blow this guy up? Yeah. Suicide, suicide to kill this dude. To kill, to kill day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then like the thing, he's like, alchemy. Big whoop or whatever. Right. Didn't understand that. Didn't I didn't know what was significant <laughs> to anybody, to either party, to either side. Yeah. On the fact that they can turn iron into gold. Well, they were trying to trick him into seeing, like, they like were that's trying to say, what they're this doing. is what we're doing in here. Okay. We take iron and we turn it into gold. Okay. But in reality, what they're doing is making the auras, which he, like, all he has to do to figure oh, that okay. out is knock okay. over a fucking box Got, okay. that's okay. filled with auras. Now, okay. Now I'm following. Now I'm following. So they're creating that a was, weapon. That was... They, they were trying to fake it, that that's what yes. they're doing in there is turning iron into gold. So when like when the director jumps in and he's like, I've got iron, <laughs> I was also like, what the fuck is he acting like that for? <laughs> and that lady's like chanting in the background. You're like, uh -huh. okay, that was everyone in there jumping in and joining in to the- To the, the ruse. The, to the ruse, yeah. the show okay. that Polly puts on, right? Okay, all right. And they all know about this show because it's the show they put mm -hmm. on on other planets to convince people to join the Foundation. Okay. And in reality, all they're doing is making these auras and potentially other armory type but stuff. But I think the they're most important weapons. thing is the auras because only the Emperor is supposed to have those. If you've okay. got an aura, you're, you're hard to hurt. You're really tough to kill. Yeah. And yeah. an army of people wearing auras would be extremely problematic for Empire. So, okay. yeah, it does seem like that's the whole so plan. That's what inflames him so. Yes, he flips yeah. the fuck out okay. once he realizes, like, holy what shit. What they're doing, yeah. You, you rebel fuckers. Okay, yeah. all right, got it. Um, so he freaks out, he stabs one of Constance's dads, the director the of the director. foundation. He orders the capture of the scientists and the execution of everyone else in the church. And then, before leaving Terminus, he remembers, like, oh yeah, Harry Seldon's over in that vault. <laughs> I'm gonna go visit him. Yeah. And he enters Harry Seldon's vault, followed by Dimmerzel, which was just another scene where I was like, we're really doing this right now? <laughs> just, you guys didn't have enough going on this episode? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Going, to the, going into the vault. So another, like, one I couldn't look away from here, this scene, where, like, Harry Seldon seems to know that Dimmerzel is actually the one running the show. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. he seems fully aware, like, this robot chick is, is the actual yeah. problem I need to deal with. And kind of disregards Brother Day, mostly speaking to Dimmerzel instead. He offers Dimmerzel the Prime Radiant in an effort to help her understand the Foundation's grand plans to save humanity, which she seems she seems to grasp. I just don't I don't know why she would give a shit about saving humanity. Humanity mm -hmm. wiped out her entire race except right. for her. Um, but for whatever reason, Harry Seldon seems to believe that. If he can get Demerzel like on his side somehow, or you know, at least seeing things from his perspective, that that would be helpful. Brother Day again, again throws like a tantrum as his insignificance grows more and more apparent, and he like threatens to destroy all of Terminus if Harry will not admit his math to be flawed. Yeah, which of course he will not do. Basically, the way that I was you know understanding this is that this this particular Cleon is desperate for real legacy. He yeah. wants to be looked at as somebody that that enacted change right and therefore kind of like subverted psycho history they couldn't account for me yeah that was a great line you know basically and like is is really really taken down like harshly when selden basically says i've met outliers you like you're not one you, gail <laughs> yeah salvor yeah like these are outliers basically and like you're you're not one. you don't right? matter you don't you don't matter and like you're you're just like all the rest um you're a big fat nothing burger yeah and like yeah uh he's like quiet and, down the grown-ups are talking <laughs> it's brutal i mean you watch you watch brother day get absolutely psychologically destroyed yeah. here yeah. in this episode. Uh, and, and and that was, but that was the offering is to essentially, all Harry had to do was be like, yeah, sure you matter. Uh, the numbers may not have taken you into account and maybe you switching things up and like not having any more clones and like marrying this Sarath chick. Like, yeah, maybe it changes things. Yeah, but he didn't. But he doesn't because he can't, because he says that's like, again, like that's just not, you know, he's sticking to his guns here. No deal. 
and 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 seals the fate of Terminus, which is all very interesting because uh, you know, you gotta like again, like the kind of the constant kind of thought in the back of your mind with any of these major things that happen is, you know, are it, you're kind of a, you're almost asking the same question that day is like, is this what's just supposed to happen? Is this what is, what is foretold or prognosticated in the psycho history? Or is this a total aberration and and one of these crises that's throwing us all into to to different chaotic paths? Yeah. So. And I have no idea. Yeah. I, mean, I yeah. have no fucking clue, but it is very fun to watch. Um. So yeah, yeah, another another wild and wild scene where we've got all the big guns really having it out in the vault. In the vault, <laughs> which is I, I would remind you has the... Hober Mallow's poo poo in it. <laughs> yeah, like don't, for, t- don't forget. People forget. Shit in people there. forget that. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they yeah. do. Very important aspect of the vault, which may or may not exist anymore. I... <laughs> well, let's get to that in a second. Yeah. Uh, before they leave, Harry tells Demerzel. That the future is invented every second, and he calls on her to invent a better one. Yeah. Seems like he's really trying to empower this robot lady, mm-hmm. which we're all fucking terrified of as, like, the big bad main villain of the show at this point. So it's really confusing and contradictory. So Brother Day and Demerzel exit the vault. I would note we do not see them leave or the end of their convo. It kind of, like, just cuts to, like, Demerzel and Day walking, walking like, 200 yards further away from the mm-hmm. vault than you would expect. And he orders General Rios to bring the Invictus, the ship that the Foundation apprehended last season on, you know, he wants them to crash this fucking thing into Terminus and destroy both the ship and the entire planet of Terminus together. Yep. And this is complicated because in disarming the Invictus so that they could even do this, Bell Rios' husband, Glewin, crash landed on Terminus. So bringing the ship down on the planet would mean General Rios killing his own husband. And they do get one last opportunity to talk to each other where Glaywin insists that Rios has no choice but to do it. He's like, the, the, the galaxy is better off with you in charge of this lunatic's army than otherwise, which is hard to disagree with. Mm-hmm. I mean, because mm-hmm. it's like, if you're going to talk about things you could see coming, like, you know, Demerzel being more than meets the eye, mm-hmm. you got to see Bell Rios eventually flipping to the other side coming, right? One no- million percent like this just is the nail in the coffin we've been feeling this for a while but like without a doubt yeah at this point you gotta know that dude is going to be like in some way shape or form the leader of the rebellion and i and you know and it's okay when when shows and films telegraph stuff like this as long as it feels earned and i think it does i feel like they they spent a lot of time with bel rios and glaywin throughout this season yep um they invested they they invested they absolutely did and this this is uh I, well performed, well acted by both by both uh, Bell Rios and and the actor who's playing Glaywin. Uh It's heart wrenching. They make you feel it. It sucks. It's, Dude, it's tragic, brutal. Uh, and and but Glaywin at the same time is right. Like there's you you don't really have a choice here because we're either both going to die and you're going to punish and you're going to get punished as well. And somebody's going to fill your shoes just like you've always said. Right. And carry out all of these this you know these despicable orders anyway. Or you can have some control of what happens by 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 staying in your position, and that so it's, you know, it's. Uh, but but yes, to answer your question, yeah, we are headed towards a Bel Rios, uh, yeah, badass tour, tour a turn, not a heel turn, whatever the opposite of a of a of a heel turn is. Yeah, a yeah, face turn. Um, no, this was. I mean, it was powerful stuff, and uh, it just. It was. T- I mean, it's tough to watch because they have invested so much in these two guys over the season, and and th- this they've been driving us toward this moment for a while, and we finally get it here. And yeah, it was, they're, it was they're, brutal. You know, we've seen planets destroyed in Star Wars as well. Um, yeah, and again, like the difference between Star Wars, which is mostly made for kids and a little bit for adults, and like a show like this, which is pretty categorically made for for adults this is a lot more grown up i don't want to piss off the star wars people but yeah well yeah i mean and and i look we we've sit here and we've sat here and praised something like andor you know over and over and over again for for elevating to this type of level where there are real stakes and people matter and like and it's not so simplistic yeah yeah. uh and so the fact that we've spent nearly two seasons kind of getting to know everybody on terminus knowing this is our home base knowing this is like where the foundation was supposed to be it, having Constance's two dads there, having Polly down there on the ground, having the vault there, which was has been super special through nineteen episodes, like, like all, all of that. We we were just there for th- for 
30 minutes watching people, you know, build auras and live life and, and yep. everything. And then to watch this essentially, <laughs> you know, three mile long nuclear bomb, like drop into the planet, experience a singularity and implode the entire thing is like very, very. It's fucked up. It's it, that, that was, that, that was a tough watch. Yeah. You know, I mean like for, for things that fall outside of the realm of just like straight up murder and gore and like, you know, gratuitous stuff like that. Like outside of that type of stuff, which is kind of just objectively hard to watch, right? Um, this was they, they 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 really did they really did this, and they went all the way, and you and you felt it, um, and and then they just rubbed salt in the wound with psychopath day, uh, standing there on the bridge, smiling and and and, and enjoying yeah. the entire thing. Uh, um, dude, I also love the layer they gave Bel Rios and Glaywin that like you have to remember, Bel Rios was on a penal colony. He thought. Glaywin was dead for six years. Yeah. So they've kind of already experienced losing each other. Yeah, yeah. Right? Which I think, in the end, backfired because it makes it easier for them to both make the sacrificial decision here. Like, Bel Rios is like, well, I've already lived six years of my life thinking this person was dead on some right. level. Glaywin has to feel the same way from the opposite stance. And yeah. I, I think that, that made it even more powerful. But, um... Yeah, so before the destruction on Terminus, by the way, really quickly, Dimmerzel senses like some danger, which I assumed was in the form of a message from Cleon the First, um, who has just captured Brother Dusk and Rue. Yeah, right? not really quickly. This is maybe maybe one of the more important scenes of the entire episode, and it's actually the only one that I went back and rewatched with the subtitles on to make sure that I oh, yeah? that I gathered everything because it felt super important. Yeah, um, she ends up uh, like abandoning Brother Day, yes. so that he has to destroy Terminus alone. She and pulls the Patrick Bateman. I have to return some videotapes, exactly, and just like bails. But but, she, not, but, but not before, before she bails, <laughs> she yeah. completely dismantles just his co psyche. Cooks this dude. Yeah, yeah. She yeah. uh, she tells him that she only instigated a sexual relationship with him in an effort to manipulate him into making the right choices because he was a dingbat. Like somebody needed to try to get you to do shit not so poorly. To got yeah, to got yeah. She had apparently she kind of makes like an absentee father excuse. Yeah, you know, or absentee parent. She's like, uh, the, both parents can be absentees, um, and she's like, you know, I had to do this a lot when you were young, and it's my fault, and I let you kind of like go off the the beaten path. And she she says you're uncertain in in mind and morals yeah. right you have uncertainty she's in basically mind like and you're morals. a piece of shit and i and but i don't know what that means does that mean he doesn't have conviction either way or his morals are shit or, or what i think he's just you know worth, I mean? like to her he's worthless and so the the se she initiated this sexual relationship to try to gain more you know more more hand yeah uh and and that didn't work and then she tells him that he's a lost cause. He's never going to change. Go do your thing. Uh, I got to. I got to get back to Trantor and deal with some shit. Which you, I, that, which I, I was just thinking while we've been having this discussion right here and now was thinking about what that could have been. Your thought is a good one that she's like mentally triggered by a communication from Cleon. But I also was like, she's watching him make this decision, and which I think she decidedly thinks is the wrong one. Right. Right. It, oh, definitely it, thinks it's the wrong one. Is she now racing back to uh, kill Queen Sarath? Is is what I'm wondering. It's another option. So that, that's another thing that popped in my mind. It's like, oh wait, okay. Is she now just like, okay, now I got to do what I got to do. Enough is enough. Yeah. Because uh, that's you know that's another question that we've had is why has she kind of been putting up with all this shit, humoring, yeah, sure. humoring this this end of the Cleonic dynasty. She also calls Brother Day a sperm being led around by his Ooh. tail and that he's mistaking random motion for complexity. Yeah. I thought the, the spiel she hits him with was almost like like I'm, I'm done with you. Yeah. Like you don't provide me with any value. So the other thing that popped into my head here when she's like I gotta go return some videotapes. Peace. She doesn't want anything to do with this. He is basically dead to her. There, There's more of him. Like, is she just like, fuck this one, I'm on to the next one, I'll try to do the next brother day better, like, maybe I go decant another one, you right. know what I'm yeah, saying? So, yeah, like, there's yeah. a lot of options here yeah. <laughs> for why Demerzel decides to leave him so abruptly, mm -hmm. but it did almost feel like she, like, went to the earpiece. Like, no, she, she was like, yeah. what was that? 
okay, got to go. Yeah. And, and then I, she hits him with all this brutal shit that she otherwise I don't think would have said. Yeah. Right? She clearly has been thinking all of this for a while, but she finds this opportunity to unload it on him and kind of cut the cord between them. Yeah, that, that little pause that we see from her where she where something registers, like yeah. another, another read you could potentially have is that just like everything that she just kind of heard and discussed with Harry Seldon is kind of like clicking, clicking into place. Um, that could be kind of what yep, she's, that she's, could be it too. she's realizing, but, but yeah, something, some, a, a, a switch kind of flips there in that moment. We don't know what it is yet, but she, but it immediately makes her essentially like end this relationship. Yeah. Almost, dude, like a breakup. You know? yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, that, that was, uh, that was rough going, but it certainly seals Terminus's fate. Yeah, yeah, it does. It, I mean, it was another it was another incredible scene, though, too, in terms of, like, if you're sitting there as a viewer, you're like, holy shit. Yeah. I mean, it was another holy shit scene. So Invictus crashes into Terminus, destroys the planet, destroys the First Foundation, kills Polyverus off, and Brother Constance's dads, and everyone else. And everybody else on Terminus. Who's living yeah. there, destroying the vault, question mark? Like, we, I, that was the... You know, as you're watching Polly, he's, like, mm. sitting there, like, accepting his fate, and the planet's exploding behind him, rolling towards him or whatever. Yeah. I was like, I don't know. The vault seemed pretty fucking important to me. Right. Like, is that <laughs> thing also <laughs> blowing up here? Like, what the hell is happening? It, and to be frank, I don't remember shit from the finale of this. <laughs> so I'm literally asking. Like, I don't know what the fuck is happening here. If, if there is anything on the planet that can somehow make it through a singularity and a nuclear implosion of the entire planet, you got to think it would be the vault, which has all sorts of mystical, mysterious, mathematical, and scientific properties that it allow it to expand, contract, change shape, all sorts of... Send out a weird wave wall thing. Yeah, all, that all it's sorts got, of yeah. weird stuff. So it can I also would, fry people. I would not be surprised if, if the vault just kind of like packs up and shoots itself off into space heads, or something. Heads from somewhere the, else. Yeah, yeah. Do you think there's any chance that it, it saves Polly Verisoff? And I, I, I think Polly is is a goner. Okay. Yeah. That's sad. Yeah. I really liked him. <laughs> Drunken little goofball. <laughs> um, so that was it for Terminus, which was terminated. Then over on Ignis, which we haven't even touched on no, with regard to no. episode nine, because frankly, the the Terminus, or I'm sorry, the Ignis story for episode nine can be told in like three sentences. Yes. And uh, so with the help of Terminus Harry Seldon, Salvor James Harden is able to escape her physical and mental prison and stop Soldier Boy Tellum from body jumping into Gale in what was a pretty rudimentary little fucking cult, uh, you know. Yeah, real old school. I mean, just laying down on a table. They got some sand paintings atop them mm -hmm. that when those match up, everybody's fucked or something. Yeah. <laughs> Which like... Part of my questioning about this whole thing here is like, did Tellum somehow partially Get end some up power. surviving this situation? Like, I, I'm, you know, we see Harry beat her to death, mm -hmm. <laughs> but did she somehow yeah. maybe get into Gail's mind a little bit? Because we did see their foot, the pictures above them did end up matching, right? And a like a couple of times, I think there's at least a few because seconds there where she could have uh, well, they're, accomplished they're, something. They're, they're going through the the chant. Basically, right? The ritual. Yeah. And it's yeah, like, yeah. now open your eyes so that I can have your sight. And it's like, dun, 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 dun. And then like the pictures match up. And yeah. It's like transfer. You know, the file, the file is in Tellum. Um, yeah. And, and then, she's controlling Gale for a few seconds yeah, there yeah, too, yeah. where Gale's then, like fighting off Salvor because then, this lady's in charge. Yeah. And they go through that. And it's like, it gives her sight. And now I have your health. And now I have your, your body. Your, 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 you're hearing, and then your bot, and then like the body is the last one, I think. Yeah. That like doesn't quite all the way go through, but yeah, she's existing in there, and um, fortunately, all it takes to re to remove the um, you know, the the demon, as it were, from Gail's body to exercise the is, demon is one hard pimp slap. Yeah, <laughs> one hard pimp slap to the face. <laughs> That's Ignis. <laughs> um, so, a long escape scene ensues here. And the body inhabiting Harry Seldon, the one that has a body, right, that we believe to be drowned, right, shows up and, and beats Tellum to death in a very violent bludgeoning scene. Yeah, this all this all gets, saves the day. This all gets super tense and actiony. Salvor, uh, you know, has to sends Gale into the to the beggar. 
but then has to defend. She got to redo she, that whole she's fight, got a whole battle with uh, with with Hugo. That's not Hugo, right? Uh, Again, and and meanwhile, Tellum somehow gets into the beggar too because she's a mentalic with all sorts of superpowers because she just she gets all the powers from every body. Her, her that she excuse inhabits. was, "We know the uh, land really well." <laughs> It's like, okay, we didn't need that line. I'll just uh, take it for what it is. Props to Tellum, though, for getting more psycho every single episode. Yeah, she was great. They really did a nice job of building her up. Uh, you know, and I know that, like, we've seen this before. And, and, like, the cult leader, who's, like, really charismatic at first, like, gets crazy more psycho every single episode. But they did a nice job just kind of, like, getting a little bit more sinister every single time. Rachel House was the Rachel actress. House, there you yeah, go. She crushed it. Uh, and, and, yeah, Rachel House is all the way, or Tellum is all the way, like, on the warpath now. She's going to beat the shit out of and murder everybody. Um, Salvor sort of helps, but then she like gets in the mix. She gets knocked around too or something like that. Yeah. And then out of nowhere, he also knows the land very well. He does. Is zombie Harry Seldon, <laughs> apparently not drowned, um, who smashes her skull in. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. With yeah. some type of bludgeoning tool. Yeah, that was it for Tell Him. <laughs> uh, I didn't see that coming. Like, I didn't see a lot of this episode coming. And, uh, and, he, and he that hits, was it. And, he, and then sits down and hits us with the, I never liked her. Yeah. Which was another, <laughs> you can only get away with a cheesy line like that in a super fucking badass episode of yeah, TV. So yeah. I, I was like able to write it off, but it did occur to me. Like, we didn't need that one either. <laughs> this, the same way we didn't need the line from uh, Tell Him about how she got there. But all in all, like this two episode stretch between eight and nine. Wild. I shit, mean, this dude. is. I'm not saying it's like the best that TV can possibly achieve, but this was great. This was great TV. It was really, really, really good. I, I, I've so I've watched two episodes of the new season of Fargo now. Um, so I think, and I think there's three out with a fourth coming middle of this week. And I know I kind of exclaimed about it on on Patreon on Thursday about how like it's the first show that's like really kind of like knocked my socks off in a few months here. And I think it's one of the, the the first episode, especially, is one of the best things I've I've seen on TV all year. And I think, uh, like, j and, and so obviously I'm kind of comparing and contrasting it to this show here, Foundation, which which we're covering in depth and really really enjoying as well. And I think like Fargo is 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 doing something really like kind of unique and interesting, and maybe kind of subverting my expectations, even though it's following a, a bit of a formula. Foundation is just like executing this this type of sci-fi material at an extremely high level you know like like and i i and and so i think maybe like the difference is that that i feel like i've seen more of this whereas fargo feels a little newer and fresher because it's been a minute since something since they since since somebody executed on this type of storytelling really well yeah well you and i quit on the last season because it did. wasn't good yeah yeah but 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 this yeah this four four episode run of foundation has been really really good as well extremely enjoyable um great twists great reveals good writing they're focusing on things that are super interesting i love that we're getting the demerzel backstory what's happening on ignis is 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 also very cool um and and and, and like i kind of like you know said at the beginning of the podcast is leaving us in an incredible place where <laughs> All of a sudden, there's no foundation. Yeah. Which is nuts heading into the finale of season two. Not what you expected, I bet, from a show called Foundation. I thought we'd have two foundations <laughs> at this point. We've we just de lost we one. We were definitely on the path. Towards, we have none towards right, two right foundations. now. And I, yeah, like it, it's, yeah, it's just so interesting because I, b because we're asking those questions about the psycho history now and about, you know, it, it, is the path changing? Is psychohistory accurate? Because Harry's plan is just kind of getting foiled at every step of the way. He thought he needed two foundations and now to, for all of this to go correctly. Yeah. And now he has zero. And the thing that's really like messing with me rolling into the finale, we watch the scene where Salvor goes to the vault and visits Vault Harry. And, and he's like, no, no, don't tell me. I'm not supposed to know stuff. <laughs> All right, tell me, tell me. I can't, I can't, I can't. I need to know. Tell yeah, me, tell me, yeah, tell me. Tell. Right. Like, he he delves into the space with them. Yeah. Like, and that's, we've seen time and again that he's like, don't give me knowledge, you know, or like he's spoken about how you could accidentally alter things. He's told um, Gail point blank, I know you want to save Salvor and keep this mule thing from happening, mm -hmm. but that's not how it works. But then he's here working with Salvor to escape from this fucking mind prison thing so that he can go out and then showing up and... 
Right. And right. the Harry that we see beat Tellum to death is a completely different Harry than the one that she was interacting with in the vault to get out of the fucking mind prison. Like, it's just, there's a lot. It's tight. There's though. a whole lot, and it is tight. This is the stretch of the show that got me like, all right, we have to do this show. Because I was like, it's gotten so good. It just has. Well, and I, and I have a far greater understanding for why people are are more bullish on season two than they are in season yeah. one. Because this, this type of storytelling is addictive, and like it gets all your wheels turning, and it's simultaneously asking a bunch of real, real, really cool questions that are that are you know very like like kind of existential like, like, Def- like hugely the, existential like the stuff that we were talking about earlier with 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 society being guided by the by the the hands of of dead men and ghosts um as well as just like really cool plot questions about a story that we're now very inv- that we're now heavily invested in so it's 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 operating at a really high level and uh i, I mean i'm has this been renewed for season three, by the way? Yeah, you know? I'm, I'm pretty confident okay. it has been. Because uh, I'm going to be exceptionally disappointed if it's not. Uh, I hope that, yeah, people, pe- we, we, I'm glad that we're being torchbearers for this show because I know, I know we've gotten people that may not have watched, that may not have, you know, cho- uh, made the choice to watch this show to watch it. And we need more of that. We need the word of mouth because I think that this show could have an even greater audience. Season three is is good. Yeah. Um, oh well, it says as of September yet to be renewed. Season three. Okay. But I have to imagine. There's no fucking way. Like Apple TV has so much money, man. Yeah. There's no way they walk away from this thing right. while it's gaining as much momentum as it has, and while we, while we are covering it here on the greatest TV podcast in the world. Yeah. Uh, one note on Fargo season five. I have watched, I believe, three. And I think there's like one more out than I expected, or maybe they do the thing on Hulu where they show you. They just show you the uh, yeah, yeah, trickery. Yeah. Yeah, okay. It's trickery. All right. Yeah. So we got another one coming Wednesday. Trickery. John Hamm with nipple rings. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was tight. Yeah, it was good. It was good. I liked it. It's it's great. <laughs> no, also, it's... Sh- shouts to Joe Curie. Who's that? He's Steve from uh, Holy Stranger shit, Things. I knew I recognized that dude. Yeah, that's him. With with no crazy eighties hair. Yeah, he's yeah, He's doing yeah. like kind of a Minnesota accent. Is kind of like a like he's kind of a douchey badass, but maybe not that badass. Well, but we've all run into a cop. Exactly. It's kind of a hardo, but not that hard. It's like, come on, guy. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. You, you were you just couldn't wait to become a cop exactly. when you got bullied in high school, huh? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Per- he's perfect for that. Love uh, lo- love what he's doing. Um. Yeah, that 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 show is hitting hard right now too. It's very very good. Yeah. Um, I didn't feel as strongly as you did about episode one, and when as I got through two and three, I was like, God damn, this is Fargo is back. Is yeah. what I'm saying. I, I think I I responded to, to episode one so well because I'm always, you know, and I'm, I I compared it to some of the episodes in season one of True Detective. Yeah. Whenever yeah. you can make a one hour episode of television feel like the coolest movies. Yeah. I, I'm like that. Uh, Two thumbs up! What an accomplishment! Yeah, because that 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 the that episode by and large didn't do a ton as far as the the. It was pretty straightforward plot wise, yeah. right? Right, you know. But it's just enthralling. Lady gets kidnapped and goes on like this crazy mission, and then she's kind of a Rambo, and you're like, "What the hell is happening?" Yeah, what but the like, fuck is this? But just uh, you know, the guy having the Anton Sugar haircut in the you know yeah. even it, it was just all. So it all just worked for me, Dude. and I was like, "This is this is." T-. And my my palms were sweating the entire time. You know, it like got to me. So that's it. It triggered all sorts of responses. And I, I, I just, when your fiance's feet, yeah, uh, I, <laughs> my my hands, her feet. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly right. Oh, More fuck. F- you have to go to Patreon if you want. To yeah, if you want to understand that all, joke, if you want all the foot talk, if you want, if you want me want talking feet, feet, yeah, yeah, getting real horned up, <laughs> and you got to go over to patreoncom slash oysters, clams, cockles. There's also the supernatural shit is getting completely out of control. It's the last thing I'll say about Fargo. Okay. Um, Patreon.com slash Oysters, Clams, Cockles. Later this week, Barrett and I will talk about the House of the Dragon Season 2 teaser trailer. We'll talk about True Detective Night Country's new trailer. And we will further digest and discuss Foundation Season 2 Episodes 8 and 9 with hotline calls from the Mollusk Militia there on Patreon.com slash Oysters, Clams, Cockles. Join us. Don't miss it. You'll regret it for the rest of your life if you do. Support our sponsors. Today we had Factor, factormeals.com slash OCC50. Use code OCC50 to get 50% off. For more from me, Ross Bolin, listen to the Ross Bolin podcast wherever podcasts are played. For more from Barrett, follow him on social media, at Barrett Dudley on Instagram is the best place. That is the best place. He puts up all his stuff and his stories and such. 
Follow me at WR Bolin. Go to bolinmedia.com slash shop to grab yourself some OCC merch for the holiday season. We've got Succession-themed stuff, House of the Dragon-themed stuff, the White Lotus-themed stuff, all kinds of good stuff in there. bolinmedia.com slash shop. Just click on Oysters, Clams, Cockles once you're in there, and you'll see all the OCC merch. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Those of you on YouTube, we appreciate you. Until next time, please respect and enjoy the podcast. 